access some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle here on the We Are Libertarians Network with a new, fresh, freshly uh, designed website. Um, I'll tell you all the ways that I'm a glutton for punishment after we get back. We're going to talk about the Inspector General's report. Maybe just give our initial thoughts on impeachment, but we won't dwell on that. We've done so many shows on that, and I can't take it anymore. So we'll be right back after this. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. It is so nice to be with you uh, this week, the week before Christmas. Uh, we won't have a show next week. It's Christmas week, and um, I come from a broken home, and so <laughs> I have like seven Christmases to go to, and uh, I listen, I just, I'm busy next week. But I know you are too, so you probably won't miss us. Um, all right, stop that. Stop that. Uh, there's more professional ways to fade that down, but I listen, I'm punchy. Uh, I'll explain why in a moment, but let me explain who's here. Harry is not here. That is probably my fault. I hope he doesn't quit. Uh, we were going to do this Tuesday, and I got a horrible stomach flu, and I slept through the time we would have been podcasting. And so I was like, hey, can we reschedule to Thursday? And I said it in the Facebook group. But Harry refuses to use that. He only uses Discord. So I have like 20 hosts in one chat, and I can tag people. And then I have to go to Discord, a completely separate website, to message Harry. Uh, I also sent out Christmas cards to our patrons and some of our former patrons. And uh, Harry refused to give me his address. So I don't know if Harry's quitting or what, but um, hopefully <laughs> – Hopefully Harry's not mad at me that we're doing this episode and he didn't know about it. But uh, I hope I hope he joins. Harry, if you're watching on Dear Leaders Court, then please jump in if you'd like. Um, that laugh that you hear in the background is the lovely Trisha Stewart, host of Gingerarchy yeah. here on with the We Are Libertarians Network. Trisha, how are you doing? I am fantastic. How are you, Chris? I am great. And then also is the John C. Dvorak of We Are Libertarians. Uh, Reinhold is lurking in the background. Reinhold, how are you? I'm doing well. Last but always least. So, Would you uh, like to yell at the listeners for a newsletter or <laughs> you have a <laughs> train that you'd like to talk yeah, about? Look, if you're going to, you know, open a newsletter, send in the, send in the donations, right? <laughs> you have that done. We're not going to be on the air anymore. That is actually true. Uh, if you guys don't contribute to Patreon, then we won't exist anymore. So, um, but we don't have like a cool 3333 type thing like the Great No Agenda podcast, which I got turned on to by Reinhold, but he can't stand it because uh, he has Trump derangement syndrome and they don't. So they have tr they have the other version. Yeah, they have the other version uh, of Trump derangement syndrome. So you're openly admitting you have the opposite version of it, Dennis. Is I that what not. you're saying? I'm I, I disdain all politicians for the most part. So Trump is just the worst of the politicians that I've seen recently, although oh. there are some making the list as well. I'm going to okay. say, let me interrupt. Reinhold, you look almost handsome. I don't know oh. what the, what is going on. He looks with tan. He looks very tan. Well, Dennis, I, you look I did great deal. The ring light that I got. So hopefully this, this new lighting actually shows off my, my handsome features and my yeah you look tan you look you look, <laughs> you look good well i did i did go to the doctor um a week ago <laughs> and found some they found some issues <laughs> All right. it up and i feel better see I feel that's the kind better. of friend yeah. i am you're like i went to the doctor they found some issues and i went <laughs> uh, <laughs> dying. they get old things happen so i have a few pills to take every day now but i feel better so that's, that's good, good. 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 Well, take care of your health. We, we need you around. We need you to keep annoying. See, it's funny because 
I consider on We Are Libertarians, Trisha to be like our outreach to the Mises Caucus people. And I consider Reinhold to be the thing that keeps the Mises Caucus people from liking us. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Um, I, I, I think I'm the, I'm the one who keeps everyone from liking us, though. So you have to be okay. careful there. I think that's me. I, I am annoying, and I am a shit poster. And so it's like, man, Nick Sarwark's taking a lot of shit right now. I better retweet him just to piss people off. <laughs> I don't know why I do it. I, uh, oh, you have to. Well, yeah, on, on Twitter, somebody asked, what annoy libertarians in a single sentence? And I just retweeted it and wrote, Murray Rothbard is an asshole. And it got no there light. You go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. necessarily not true. No, he was an asshole. He was, I mean, he was, a, asshole. He was a brilliant Oh, my man. God. Listen, he was Trisha. not an asshole. No, Shut was, your damn mouth, Christopher. He was an asshole. It doesn't mean that he wasn't a brilliant intellectual who had a lot of- He actually people. wasn't a cruel person. I, I know no, a lot no, about his- cruel. No, neither, is, cruel. neither is Reinhold, but he's an asshole. <laughs> okay, then we can talk about Ayn Rand. She was a cunt. Yeah, I love her. <laughs> right. I think brilliant, br brilliant people like those folks, they really like interpersonal relationships are just harder for people who have the amount of like brain power that Murray and Ayn had. I just think that they struggle more with interpersonal relationships than a lot of other people. doesn't mean they're bad people. It's just, you know, you look back at, uh, I'm not letting, listen, I'm not saying that his work is, uh, I've committed the unpardonable sin, which is saying something bad about liber about Murray Rothbard, libertarian Jesus, but that was the point of the tweet was to- I, I don't agree. I, I don't agree with Rothbard and everything. I've learned quite a bit from him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't agree with him on every point. And when someone says, well, Murray said this, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. It means I should look yeah. at it, but it doesn't mean it, it's exactly correct. Is it- Murray said a lot of things that he sometimes- was against his own statements on. Yeah. Right? He changed well, I, his views. Well, he grew time. too, and there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. Yeah. You can't write the prolific amount of information that Murray Rothbard wrote over the span of your lifetime and not come to different conclusions at certain points. You know what I mean? Like, I just think that's impossible. You listen to this dumb podcast, and I've changed my mind 1,700 times. Well, oh, look, I have too. Oh. Yeah. Ow! If you look back at my writing, I was actually uh, one of my earlier writings was get out of here defending the uh, case for going into Iraq. So, <gasps> uh, wait, what? <laughs> back that train up, Dennis. Wait, are you uh, dead serious? Yeah, I it, and it was not okay. So, my my rationale for supporting that was uh, I was on the fence, but my rationale had nothing to do with the WMDs. It was a diff whole different thing. It was the promise mm -hmm. we made the Kurds but that's you know well we fucked them six ways from Sunday oh, so yeah so many times so horribly yeah. and I was like we owe them you know at least this to get that guy out of office they that need to stop listening to time. us I mean honestly <laughs> <laughs> what, was the, what was the Kissinger pull them 46 times shame on them <laughs> we, yeah we had a we had a quote by Kissinger about the Kurds it's like if you want to tell a joke in the Middle East promise something to the Kurds I think it was some, like Ooh. paraphrasing <laughs> I'm sorry I yelled, but my cat scratched the hell out of me. Aw, did you need a Band-Aid, Christopher? I honestly do. And I <laughs> locked her in the room. Thank you, too, for covering. Like, oh, it hurt so bad. Yeah. Well, we were talking that. about um, the Kurds in Iraq, that how, how basically a lot of those people thought that we were covering their asses and they got murdered. But I'm really sorry about your finger. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, had some, they had some gas that let them go to sleep. Right. Yeah. yeah. They had a peaceful good night. Yes. <laughs> Where Chris is still suffering. Uh, we are libertarians has finally been labeled fake news. <laughs> um, just wanted to bring officially, this. Yeah, officially by by uh, Facebook, right? Yeah, Instagram. Oh, that's so, official. Instagram. Okay. Uh, our buddy. Well, they're Stone. the same thing. Yeah, but our buddy Stone posted a meme about Epstein, and uh, it was labeled as fake news. It now has a cover over it before you can see the meme, and it says uh, uh, it was posted today, December 19th, 2019. So if you're listening far in the future, uh, false. it has a covering. like It's like, you know those graphic photos of dead Syrian children that Trisha posts on her Facebook? It like, covers it up and like, this is a disturbing image. Click here if you want to see it. And yeah. 
It says false information reviewed by independent fact checkers, CY or C post. And uh, the fact checker, uh, more information, false. There's no evidence Hillary Clinton killed Jeffrey Epstein. It runs counter to medical examiner and federal prosecutor conclusions. Oh, so false. Instagram is now censoring our memes. We have been, uh, if you, you can go check that out on our, our Instagram. But um, it, was, it was only a matter of time before we started to being censored as fake news before, ahead of the 2020 elections. It will only get worse. I, I have made mm-hmm. I'll be amazed if any of us are, have access to Facebook or Instagram ahead of the 2020 election. They completely removed me from Facebook before the last election. Uh, I, I'd just be surprised if we have any posting power to our 96,000 Facebook likes in October of this year. So we'll see. But uh, we are officially fake news, Reinhold. People have been saying you're fake news for years. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is nothing new for me. But here's the funny part. I've never been pulled off Facebook. Never. Really? Uh, not even a friend. Oh, you never had a ban? Nope. Never had a ban. I'm smart enough to know how to get around it now. <laughs> how? For a small cost of nineteen ninety nine a month, <laughs> I will tell you how, Christopher. I'd I rather- actually, I do know the ins and outs of it. But I, I'm attached to lots of pages now because of that. So... <laughs> Okay, nineteen ninety nine for Trisha's secrets on Facebook. Nineteen ninety nine yes. for Trisha's feet pick. I can't figure out. What yes. That. Oh, do the. Fe- I'll send you bath water for a hundred dollars. <laughs> so give yeah. you a deal if you go all three too. If yeah. You, you oh, oh yeah, for sure. And then you'll get some extras. Like I'll sign some shit and send it to you. How have your DMs been? Um. What's funny is Facebook is actually like. Um, filtered stuff more so a lot of messages i get now say it's like this blank space and it says this was marked abusive Mm. um but i still get some in fact today i did and and uh uh i took take uh took advice from risa she said make it a business transaction and if somebody wants to talk to you they will continue so i said what can i do for you today yeah i've seen that yeah did you make it a business yeah uh, what can I do for you today? How can I help you? Are you interested in libertarianism? Um, I obviously uh, work with the Ohio Mises Caucus. Said, would you want more information about the Mises Caucus or whatever? And if they get mad at that, um, they'll just go off. If not, then I don't mind talking to that person at all. But it was actually really good advice. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Okay, so if um, somebody sends you just a DM to your personal account, you hit them with like some canned response that you yes. just copy and paste occasionally i mess with them because it's fun i'm not gonna lie (laughs) it's hard sometimes i ask about their mom in several different ways (laughs) right because i'm 12 (laughs) right your mom jokes are hilarious though they are funny they they never die they'll be like honey how much do you love me i'm like how much do you love how much do i love your mom you know and just how many there. people have loved your mom is the real question. Yes. But it, it's funny. A lot of men on those DMs, they'll just keep going on and on. You could drag it out infinitely. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to a letter from one of our patrons. The uh, We Are Libertarians Christmas card. I I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, I liked it. I decided I was sitting there a couple weekends ago. I was like, you know what? I really do appreciate our patrons, and I'm going to send everybody a Christmas card. 200 handwritten cards later. <laughs> My hand was bleeding. It was, it, I look like Tiny Tim in the hand. Uh, so it, but it was worth it, and I've been touched by the response back. And uh, hopefully, if you were a patron and you got your Christmas card, that uh, if you didn't get your Christmas card, you please update your address in the Patreon system. But uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. And I sent out Dear Leader's Christmas message for our patrons just to let them know that when you donate on patreon that money goes to supporting new creators like trisha and gingerarchy brian nichols Um, because the reality is that to be quite candid with you when i started we are libertarians in 2012 2013 we had the ability to grow organic reach 2012 through 2016 we had the ability to build a big facebook page to use my facebook page to grow this to grow audience And the realities of social media are that since the Trump election, it is increasingly harder for there to be organic reach. And so one thing that we do here at We Are Libertarians is we promote new creators. We try to give voice to a large group of people. We've got 
Ryan over at the WAO Reader. We've got uh, Reinhold and Libertarian Poli Policy and Politics. We've got Gingerarchy with Trisha. We've got a couple new shows coming online. And the reason we do that is to help give a speedy um, – to basically like help you just promote your show and we don't do that for everybody i try to pick people that i think are really fun and interesting and kind of fit what we do here at we are libertarians and uh give a greater voice because organic reach is largely dead on social media and so you've got to support libertarian creators it's one of the reasons i created libertarianpodcast.com and that website is just a listing of every libertarian podcast i possibly can find there's some featured shows but at the bottom, there's a list of as many as I can possibly find. Anybody is welcome to review that list and send me an email to update that. And it's just because I want the, uh, the entire space to be promoted. And uh, that is a service of our patrons. So when you are a, a member of our Patreon, you're helping to spread the libertarian message, not just here, but across the board. And one of those patrons sent me a great letter. His name is... Uh, I should have asked him because I talked to him today. Colin Golinder, Gil Gildner, Colin Gildner. All right, I think that's what it is. That's what I'm going with. Um, and he joined Dear Leaders Court and uh, sent me a great, a beautiful note here that I want to read. And please, you're always welcome. If you're a listener, a Patreon member, whatever, send us a note. If you have a question, a comment, um, you you want to complain about Ryan Hold or say nice things about him, that that is welcome. Um, Waifu questions for Harry. Editor at wearelibertarians.com is the email address. You can also leave us a voicemail at wearelibertarians.com with SpeakPipe. Uh, now, Chris writes, after listening to your latest podcast, I want to let you know how much your podcast has meant to me. I started listening around the 2016 election and survived the scat cat days of the podcast. Dark days indeed, Colin. Uh, that's a joke. That's a joke. Uh, I really don't want drama on this Christmas day. Uh, I really I really appreciate your delivery. When I talk to people about politics, I try to liken your strong yet respectful voice. I like this guy so far. <laughs> Though I have always leaned right, I grew up in Northwest Washington. Left culture is much of a religion here as you think it would be. The left sucks. But if I am trying to change minds, I need tools to talk to them. You and those that work on your network lo never lose the ability to humanize. People on the left really do care about others and want to make the world a better place. But right now, they are convinced a certain segment of the population are no longer human. When I have had success with the far left, it is through humanizing people for them. And I am considering any small move towards moderating a victory. I have appreciated listening to your personal growth as well. I lost 80 pounds in 2018 and understand that struggle. Hearing about your moves toward a healthier lifestyle was inspiring. I am not surprised that you're having so much success with what you do. Man, write a letter every week, Colin. <laughs> I listen to the pat down because of you. Miss Pat is hilarious and opened my eyes to a lot of many, uh, many different things used while using comedy as the sugar on the spoon. She has taught me a lot. But I have been counting on having you around for the hysteria that is coming over the next year. Please continue as you are able. Your words come out of my mouth so often when I talk politics, it matters. Thank you, Chris. Sincerely, Colin. So uh, thank you for the lovely letter. And I really do think that uh, the, the line in your letter, and I am considering any small move towards moderating a victory. The idea that um, our, our goal, it, listen, we get into libertarianism, and you two correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we get into libertarianism because we want some massive overarching structural change. And I think the longer you're a libertarian or the older you get, the more you realize if I can just make five people this year moderate or see other people as human beings and change their minds, that's a success for liberty. That it's, it's all of our contributions that those interpersonal contacts that we have with people, those are the successes for liberty as much as those big structural changes that will eventually come if we just get enough people. Can I speak to that, Chris? Because I think that's actually beautifully stated and everybody probably knows the Ayn Rand quote that the smallest minority is the individual, but it actually has the greatest power. Um, you know, we sit and talk about politics and it's important. Uh, obviously we're interested in politics and so are the people that listen. But if you can change somebody's heart and mind and get them to think a little bit outside of the box, that is, that's a lot of, power you know when you get individuals to change their minds and think and let go of cognitive dissonance that's where true power is because power lies with the individual not with a collective so i, I think that's 
that's what's more important. And, and like you said, I, I really had to come there. You know, I had to, I had to make my way and inch my way towards that. But it, I think it's more important when I meet somebody that says, Oh, you said something and it, it meant something to me, or I related it to my daily life. That's much more powerful than making a big statement and having a bunch of people follow you. Cause in the end that will fall flat. It's a lot easier as a goal too. Yeah. You get, lot, you get a lot less frustrated if your goal is just to like make people think differently individually uh, than it is to elect a libertarian president. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and I do, I, you know, we talk about, I get so many people that hate on me for being involved in politics in the LP, obviously because I'm an anarchist and there's plenty of us that are, that just don't care about that. But it's like, do you think maybe that I just want maybe want to talk to people and that's a great conduit? <laughs> yeah. Right. So that's okay too. I'm doing that. <laughs> so. Right home. Power to people. No, that's, um, that's the goal. I mean, really, I mean, yeah, it, the great dream would be that we would be able to um, let everybody know about retaining power for themselves and not giving it up to the state to, to use over yourself and for other people, right? So trying to rule other people's lives, there's, there's, there's no gain from that, you know, emotionally or for, for you as a person. So it'd be great to just have a mass understanding of that throughout the country. But realistically, all you can do as an individual is try to affect the people who you are closest to and around the most. And, you know, I, I can spend all my time on Facebook talking to a bunch of different libertarian minded people or libertarian thinking people and getting blocked by a third of them most of the time. <laughs> um, but it doesn't, you know, you're, you're, spe you're speaking in a choir in an echo chamber at that point, right? And yeah, we can further develop our libertarian views and beliefs. We can further kind of pump ourselves up by knowing there's other people out there like us who we can talk to and, and be friends with and, uh, or enemies with. But the, the real goal is getting the people who are sitting out there wanting, knowing that, that, that things aren't right and they don't know where to go to. And it's like, we have like half the country just really almost being independents these days because they just don't really fit in, in the current political environment and they don't know why. Um, so just kind of getting that information out there is the only way to, to affect that. Yeah. And I think for us, it's been an, an effective strategy for us has been humor. And uh, it's really hard to make a bunch of serious, sentimental, or true, or uh, just, I guess, serious is the way to put a post on Facebook. Like, you, you can, I, I really kind of, like, last year tried, like, I want to hone in. I want to be as accurate as possible. I want to work on the best message. I want to, you know, write the most persuasive paragraph I possibly can. I would spend two hours sitting there fact checking this writing the post thinking it through weeks processing it post god it, we are so different christopher only to have <laughs> a person who spent zero time thinking about it go nah -uh. <laughs> like and uh, some, somewhere over the last like over 2019 i just realized like people just want to laugh they just want to have a good time mm -hmm. facebook is be just be unserious on facebook and like mm -hmm. right now i'm posting a bunch of like people keep sending me uh, boomer thoughts on impeachment, and some of these are absolutely hysterical. They're yes, caps. They're just you. You start. You actually got it started, Trisha, when you posted the first <laughs> one in the wall group. And I love them so much. They my, bring me so much joy. <laughs> my, I felt bad about it today, though, and my grandmother's 80-something-year-old best friend shared it unironically and wrote, "Good thoughts, Chris." I was like, oh, I meant to make millennials laugh, not boomers. Uh, a, a tea party guy, like Emery McClendon's big tea party guy from up north in Indiana, and he shared one unironically. Like, oh, so no. It, it is fun. <laughs> hey, but who will click on that and then follow down the rabbit hole, Chris? Uh, it's me. You never know. My people laugh. I don't really – like, I just view social media. Like, you think about it, and you go, oh, you can't change minds on social media. But I will say that memes and – shit posting on facebook i've had several people just kind of say like because you don't take your because you're the court jester uh i've i've kind of actually saw your point of view a little bit more because i know i'm gonna laugh and so like don't just get on there and take yourself so seriously like just uh, enjoy your life. i would i would definitely say I, I wouldn't 
think that to be the end all be all. Like what Dennis said, the people you're close to, that's the most important. That's who you have the most effect on. But memes that's art. Like they have a lot of power that speaks volumes in a picture. And that's the thing is that media like art movies, books have always been the best way to affect societal change. Um, fictional stories. You keep your guard down. If you know, you're going to get lectured to your guard is up and you're going, yeah. I'm not listening to what you're saying. I'm <laughs> in my mind trying to figure out how to tell you you're wrong. But when you come across stuff in in, in in books and songs and comic books and videos and, and all kinds of different aspects and memes is just another one of those methods. Um, if you're not, if you're not knowing you're, you're getting preached to, if you're, if you're having a laugh or, or listening to a story and you come across some nugget of truth from that, it can affect you much more uh, than any other method of trying to get information out. They can stay with you for your life that way. Damn, y'all. They did it. They peached him. Write to him. Send him money. He is getting all my check this month. And next, help your president. All, in all caps. What happened to Larry? Uh, did he did uh, happen to Larry? And he's just not around. We have just experienced the apex of selfish tyranny. Our nation under God has been cursed by the wrath and anger of those who continue to disbelieve anyone <sighs> except them. Like this was written by a pastor in Colorado, and a friend sent it to me. It's a oh, book he needs to stop praying to the state and start praying to Jesus. It Lord, was really unbelievable. This deceitful fog of egoism. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, that is the one that my boomer grandmother friend said so well said. Well, to to be uh, fair, I did read part of that, and part of those things I kind of agreed with. The fact that people were so ugly, they stopped looking at uh, finding truth and faith and religion and started looking at politics. But I, as a whole, it was very cringy. What, what, did you, <laughs> what, did you, what did you ask me, Reinhold? I, I got so distracted with the meme that I... Oh, I was asking what happened to Larry. Oh, so I used to have this character... Hey, Rob. I can't even do the voice really anymore. The, the reality is that that character, the boomer Trump supporter with the hat, and there was a Snapchat filter, the one that kind of like turned your mouth upside down. And uh, it was really funny. I always made myself laugh. And in 2016, he was kind of like, it was my redneck Trump supporting character. And Snapchat took away the filter. So it just didn't look as funny. It was really Aww. my, it was my face. And so it just kind of didn't work as much as I liked it. And then a guy I work with named Brent Terhune did this redneck character that is kind of like a Trump supporting Southside redneck Hoosier. Uh, fuck the NFL and go Coats. Uh, and it's so close to his character that if I brought him back, I'm afraid that people would think that I was stealing from Brent, even though Brent, there's a chance he may have seen my character. Uh, so I don't know. I may, if they, I saw that you could buy that filter, um, but uh, I haven't gotten around to it. But I, I had people ask today for more Larry stuff. It's, I, I should have well, kept doing it because it was. Maybe you should awesome. stop being so cheap, Chris. Maybe, but it would be like seven dollars a video to shoot, and like, oh, I mean, like, yeah. So maybe we'll start a seven dollar a month Patreon fund for Larry. Um, I so, think we could do that. You heard it here first. <laughs> uh, I want to thank our patrons who give one hundred dollars a month. We want to start with Jeff Bennett. Thank you so much, Jeff, for being a patron. Uh, Matthew Durbin, thank you so much for being a one hundred dollar a month patron. Uh, Ed Brehob, good old intern Ed. We really appreciate him. Uh, Craig DaCosta, uh, man about town, traveling the world. Always great to see him and what he's up to. And Jason Doolittle, um, he, well, I won't, I won't violate HIPAA laws, but he's doing great and uh, we're very happy for him. Nothing serious. He just had eye surgery. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry, Jason. Uh, and then obviously Christy Avery, who just got some fantastic new glasses, has six days off. Um, we're, we're really happy for her and, uh, finally glad that she got, she had these glasses, Trisha, that <laughs> one, one side of the glasses were square and the other side were oval. And yeah. What the fuck was she doing? They made me, oh, I said the angry. when she yeah. showed up wearing those, I was physically, I was mad. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you were, I would get in your hot tub before I'd ever wear glasses that look like that. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so, but uh, she got. Brave. I plan on getting on Chrissy's hot tub. So, well, enjoy your fecal soup. It's nothing against your hot tub. It's just all hot tubs are disgusting, bacteria-filled <laughs> soups of poop. I won't listen to this. You you should. You no. want bacteria? Okay. I'm going to Vegas soon. I'm getting a hot tub. I'm going to a crypto mansion. It's all happening. Please yes. don't oh, destroy right. my. Thank you. Live thank your life. You. Yeah. Don't, don't yeah. be so afraid. Right, Dennis. Of the Chris can feet. sit in his apartment with his cats and fear the E. coli. I'm um, going to live. <laughs> okay. You go ahead and drink your uh, salmonella soup. You enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not drinking the hot tub water. Oh, what okay. am I? I'm not, I'm not dehydrated. I hope you don't have any open wounds on your toe and then you get gangrene. That'd be horrible. But I warned you if you do. Horrible. No sympathy. I'd just be like, I told you so. Oh, God. Like, like somebody's grandmother. Don't go out. You know what's going to happen. You're going to get a thing in your <laughs> eye. Your toe's going to turn green and fall off and none of the boys will like you. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> when you know somebody a man especially is a true best friend like somebody yeah. did something kind of mean on my instagram recently and i'm like all right this is mean this can only be one of my greatest friends in life or <laughs> one of my worst enemies <laughs> i know that feeling yeah um, who was it did you find out who it was he, yes <laughs> he was thinks your he friend no it was not my oh. friend. He's, he's, uh, i some, thought it was maybe somebody we know that hosts a show no 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 well, not. that's unfortunate. The very limited person of limited talent and low IQ. Um, <laughs> so, it, so uh, I want to I want to congratulate two people, two hosts here on the We Are Libertarians Network. First, Brian Nichols of the Brian Nichols Show, who got oh, married within the last mm -hmm. month. Uh, congratulations! He sent me photos, and Brian's wedding was beautiful. Uh, his bride was beautiful. Brian looked like Brian. It was a wonderful <laughs> ceremony. Um, and then Brian is a great guy and really smart. He really is. He's such a yeah. sweetheart. And uh, also, Trisha Stewart got engaged. I did. Look at you getting engaged. Surprise, surprise, y'all. <laughs> Blink twice if you need help. <laughs> Promise you <laughs> never get married again. I did. And I mean, have to stay, but you know. <laughs> All right. So, well, congratulations. <laughs> we are very happy yeah. for you. I won't do, when I got engaged in my first marriage, I won't do to you what the future ex-mother-in-law did to me, which is, are you sure? <laughs> um, like to her? Yeah. We oh called, she goes, mom, <laughs> I'm engaged. And she goes, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't. She so. Was you want because i'm yeah. holding back i'm holding back words about your um lesbian marriage thank you yeah uh i was well, I, think, I think everyone who's had a first marriage and they're working on their second can tell you that's that me learned a lot from the <laughs> first go around especially about how sometimes your parents saw it coming and you should have listened to it <laughs> right well or your parents pushed something that you shouldn't have listened to but I don't know who that would be. <laughs> I, so I was talking to somebody the, the other day. I go, why, they go, why do you think that there have been so many first marriages and second marriages work out? And I, I said, because I think our generation, with no disrespect meant to anybody who actually served overseas, uh, it, it, Afghanistan and Iraq were not like Vietnam even, or especially World War I or World War II. Uh, I think like men take a lot longer to grow, to grow up and it, it really is one of those things where it's like you need I had to have a profoundly horrifying experience like divorce to make me grow into an actual man and I think like for my grandfather he had the war and so my war was my opponent uh, the ex Mrs. Spangle so I, I, I don't know if that's a theory that holds water but that's I'm putting that out there for people to mull over if it catches on I want credit well, everybody needs their war. That's right. Well, you had yeah. the meme war of 2016. Yeah. I mean, that pretty much, we're all going to have successful marriages now. Ryan Held has the meme war of the 2020 chairs race. Ryan Held. Are you stalking <laughs> I you cut out on me there, so I just <laughs> all right. Let's move on. Let's get to the topic at hand. Let's talk about the Office of Inspector General's report. Uh, so you know, 
we we should touch on impeachment, but maybe we'll talk about that at the end because I'm up to my I've just had an ass full of impeachment. Uh, I know Dennis. Ooh, can talk about you should probably day. put something on that. <laughs> I really should because yes. it's full. Um, <laughs> maybe we'll get some thoughts at the at the end of the episode. But uh, want to talk a little bit about the uh, Inspector General's report that got released last week, and it was. So an inspector general is essentially every government agency has an inspector general and they are like a nonpartisan watchdog. They are the HR department for lack of a better term for a government agency. And so they are to be a, an independent investigatory body into the agency that they watch over. So if you are, let's say, uh, a whistleblower in the energy department, you go to the lawyers at the office of inspector general and they will investigate it for you. And right. So, it works just as well as the cops. It, right. Yeah. Right. It's like, it's like, and, uh, what's the SUV SVU version of it? What's the, uh, the cops investigating the cops? Internal affairs. Internal affairs. Now mm -hmm. her snark notwithstanding, Inspector General reports generally do try to be fair. They do try to, they are very deep in scope. They really try to dive deep. And, and these reports, like I think this was what, Reinhold, like 400 pages? It was big, yeah. Yeah, was, four, was, four or 500 pages. And it was basically just this massive detailed investigation into the FBI's investigation of the 2016 campaign into their connections with Russia. And they wanted to make sure that it was a justified inspection and that it wasn't driven by political bias. But what they found as they did it, now mainstream media touted this as a complete, um, this just proves that Donald Trump pushes conspiracy theories about the deep state, uh, just shows that James, James Comey and the FBI, they were all on the up and up. But it actually revealed several glaring problems, and people who are civil libertarians um, will look at this report and the episode that we're with the details we're about to give you and see some glaring problems. Some problems that when we talked about the revelations that Edward Snowden brought about, they've come home to roost, and they're, they're contained in a lot of this information. Yeah, this, and go ahead. The fact that we discovered through this uh, investigation that the uh, federal government doesn't always work well. It's like, this is my shot. <laughs> All right. See, I told you <laughs> OIG was on the up and up, Patricia. You didn't believe me. <laughs> but the, when you talk about Inspector General, too, that's where the whistleblower for uh, the Ukraine thing came from, was the intelligence com uh, communities invest. Um, Investigator General, right? He yeah. the, the complaint went, went to him. He determined it was valid complaint and therefore forwarded on. So that's where uh, that came from. So that's what those um, inspectors do. I, I have to be honest. You all have to go subscribe to the what We Are Libertarians YouTube channel to watch this video to see how handsome Reinhold looks. Like he I know looks, he looks genuinely good. Like I'm watching him talk. I'm like I can't even hear what he's saying because I'm just like, when did Reinhold get handsome? What did your house do to him, Chris, is the I question I have. He stopped coming over here and he got better looking. <laughs> oh, his camera, his camera, I'll be honest with you, the, I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> no, I've been on Chris's camera. It made me look like 15 pounds heavier. So that's, what I'm, that's what I'm blaming. My, I'm blaming it on that too. Yeah. Uh -huh. I do. I do want to admit with all full honesty, I do have the, um, the moonlighting filter. I don't know if you understand that reference because it's an old person uh -huh. reference. I thought you were uh, gonna say makeup, but that's okay. No, no, I don't have make. Actually, <laughs> my wife and I, we, I toyed with because I said something about I need to do something because I look kind of horrible on the on the videos. And um, well, she's like, "Well, we can do this," and I, I talk about my beard. So we were trying to do some stuff to kind of color the beard and stuff and things. And, and it looked pretty. It looked good, but it also looked kind of. Eh, so I just took it all. I got rid of all that. But so she's put makeup on for the video. What do you use? What do you use? A Logitech. Um, yeah, it's a Logitech, uh, 615. It's nothing, it's not big. It's like a $30 camera. Well, mine's a 920, so I need to cut mine by a third and maybe I'll look better. <laughs> but it's a, I got a ring light, which really helps with the lighting. Before I was just getting weird lights because my, 
my overhead light's not in the middle of the room. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you look like George Clooney is all I'm saying. I look terrible. <laughs> well, my hair looks great, but that's so. Back to the OIG report. Uh, but yeah, go check out our YouTube channel, please. We uh, post all these videos up on YouTube. We also post audio versions of the episode. So you can catch up and watch us on Roku and, and Apple TV and whatever. So uh, check out those episodes there. Uh, now, Scott Shackford of Reason Magazine said the following. The report analyzes the cir circumstances under which the FBI asked the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance uh, Amendment courts, the FISA courts, for permission to secretly wiretap Carter Page, a foreign <laughs> policy advisor in Trump's campaign. FBI officials were concerned that Page might be compromised or working as a foreign agent, and they sought and received permission to wiretap him permission they renewed three separate times mm. the, so the fisa courts are secret courts that were created so they're intelligence courts basically they're and, illegitimate and so they go and there's no due process they do it in secret usually uh now these fisa courts almost none of them are denied am i remembering correctly from past shows that like 99 percent of these things are just mm -hmm. Proved blindly. I mean, are just uh, a rubber stamped, right. and they could have sent them a folder full of blank paper, <laughs> and it probably would have been approved. Right, and so these are they're they're secret because they don't want them, you know, showing up in court documents. Let's say they're trying to indict Russian spies; they don't want Russia to be tipped off, but they want permission to then wiretap a Russian spy. In this case, they felt that. Carter Page, an advisor to the Trump to the Trump campaign, was a, a compromised Russian asset, and uh, they renewed a wiretap on him three separate times. Now, the FBI's request to the FISA court relied partly on a dossier alleging that Russian officials had compromising info on Trump, a dossier the former British spy, Christopher Steele, had developed as a political weapon that raised the question of whether the FISA court had received an adequate explanation about the dossier's roots and credibility. Now, stating in that report, our review found that FBI personal personnel fell far short of the requirement in FBI policy that they ensure that all factual statements in a FISA application are scrupulously, quote unquote, accurate. We identified multiple instances in which the factual assertions relied upon at the first FISA application were inaccurate, incomplete, or unsupported by appropriate documentation based upon information the FBI had in its possession at the time the application was filed. Now, the, the Steele dossier is something put together by Fusion GPS. That was, uh, uh, Fusion GPS was started by former Wall Street Journal reporters uh they the, the guy was not happy that he wasn't doing as much investigative journalism so he decided to do his investigative journalism for various people that would pay him privately and uh one of those were a, a large republican backer that through the washington examiner i believe it was started doing a background check essentially opposition research on donald trump now this is all fairly standard what you were hearing in, in all of this, and that's part of the beauty of the Trump administration, is that because the media is so out to get Donald Trump, cue the eye rolls from Reinhold, that they expose the entire political process as if it is a wholly uh, problematic part of uh, Donald Trump's world. But this is how politics really works. And so we, over the last four years, have had a great douching <laughs> a colonoscopy if you will of how uh, politics works and so a big donor will a big donor was backing a republican candidate the fusion gps folks won't say which one and uh the washington examiner and this big donor basically paid for opposition research for this republican candidate on donald trump because they felt that he could possibly actually win the nomination now, when that candidate dropped out or the Washington Examiner dropped the research, Hillary Clinton and her campaign picked it up. And the eventual background research was the, what is called the Steele dossier or the P-tape dossier. It had a bunch of information. Now, Reinhold, and I have argued time and time again, he has asserted that I have asserted that the Steele dossier was the entire linchpin of all of the Russian 
special Mueller investigations and, and all of the Russian hoax. And he claimed that that was not true. I have been vindicated thanks to the government investigations. Uh, the Steele dossier was circulating in Washington, D.C. for a while in it was it wound up in the hands of John McCain, who then took it to the FBI, who then predicated the investigation's uh, beginnings into Carter Page. The Steele dossier was a mixture of wild allegations like Donald Trump reveled in sleeping in the bed that Michelle and Barack had slept in, and he had Russian hookers pee on it on the bed as an F you to them all the way down to like very serious, true, accurate information. This British spy went over to Russia, found a bunch of, he found as many things, as many threads as he could. It came back. And that's really where the Russian hoax, the Russian narrative that Donald Trump was in cahoots with uh, the uh, Russians began. So it's all been a fiction from the very beginning. Uh, and, now I will let I will let Reinhold refute mm -hmm. that. I know he wants to, but he can't because I have an OIG report that says I'm right and he's not. No, no, the OIG report does mention what I st stated is that the Operation Crossfire was opened by the uh, the alerting, basically to the FBI of Papadopoulos, stating that they were they had information and they were working with the Russians on getting information on Hillary. That started the the investigation. Mm -hmm. The Carter Page thing used the Steele dossier to to validate itself, which it didn't really need to do. It would have been get validated anyway. But they did use that Steele dossier in uh, getting the renewals for the the Carter Page wiretap. Right, uh, that was a problem. But that doesn't mean that the whole thing started out of the Steele dossier because it didn't. It started a month or a couple months earlier through the uh, Operation Crossfire uh, through Papadopoulos. I take all of your true and verifiable facts and say you're wrong, I'm right. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, there, there, there are several threats. The reality is that Donald Trump's campaign being approached by the Russians is not in and of itself unusual. Foreign actors try to infiltrate every presidential campaign. They try to get secrets. For, campaigns, are, campaigns are like sibs. And, and they're e that's the easiest place to get access to political information. If you show up and start stamping envelopes and you do that for six weeks in a row, there's a pretty good chance that after a few months, you may un end up in the main room. And so, you know, if you can get something going on a campaign, then you can get some pretty good intel if you if you have the right people placed now it was pretty clear over the course of the last few years that every time the russians tried to gain access to trump's campaign it just didn't really go anywhere uh they they were either too incompetent or they were too smart or whatever you want to say i don't i don't know it's it's open to interpretation but there there wasn't much of a campaign to infiltrate i think may be the way to put it uh, right. i think I think he had some people around him who were smart enough to see what was going on and stop it. Like as much as I hate to say this, Jeff Sessions identified yeah. that that was kind of happening and stopped it. And I, well, well didn't Manafort didn't just kind of words to him at all, but <laughs> didn't Manafort basically get up and walk out of the meeting with Trump jr. And the Russian lawyer or something. What was the, the Don jr. Meeting in the, in the, yeah. yeah. Didn't Manafort yeah. like, or Kushner or somebody realized what was going on and got the hell out of there? Might have been Manafort. I know it wasn't Trump Jr. Yeah, it's right. Completely oblivious. And that's yeah. kind of the part of the problem is that there are some people on the campaign who were oblivious, and uh, Papadopoulos was one of those. Right. And that's where kind of all of that started. Right. So, uh, Trisha, do you have any questions, any comments? That I have a question for Dennis. Go ahead. Sure. Dennis, do you honestly think that – uh, Donald Trump, who's a buffoon, we can both agree on that, was actively knowledgeable about uh, what was happening uh, during that time and wanted to collude with the Russians to interfere with the election and give them some type of uh, pay, you know, payback when he became president. Do you actually think that happened? Uh, Donald Trump is a very transactional person. I do not believe that he was actively seeking out um, information from Russia, but I also do not believe he would have turned it down had he got it. Um, I wouldn't disagree with you, actually. 
I don't, he said, he said live on TV that he wouldn't turn it down if he got it. He said um, in an interview, they said, well, if, if somebody were to come to you now that, that this happened and a foreign power came to you with, with information about a rival, would you take it? And he said, yeah, I'd take it. I mean, it's what he said live on TV. I don't know how you can, how you can dispute that, but um, there's, there's evidence right now that because of the Roger Stone trial, that Trump knew about the impending release of the WikiLeaks information and lied to the Mueller investigation that he didn't because um, Carter Page, no, it wasn't Carter Page, who was it? Uh, Gates, I think, said that he was in the, in the room when it happened and he knows that, that Trump knew about it and it was coming. Did he say that under oath? Yeah, in the, in the uh, Roger Stone trial. So there's there's an investigation right now to find out if Trump was lying, uh, committed perjury during the Mueller investigation. So, I mean, it's going to be hard to, to prove perjury uh, because the way that Trump answered the question was, to the best of my knowledge, I don't remember mm-hmm. this. So they're going to have a hard time proving that he did remember it when he lied or when he when he uh, was interviewed by the, by the Mueller team, um, which was on paper. It wasn't person to person. But... Um, so I don't think they're going to prove that and uh, they're not going to ever prove it to the Trump fans either, but there is some question here that, uh, it's possible that he did know. And, and according to the sworn testimony in the Trump, in the, uh, Roger Stone trial that happened. So I, well, I believe Dan, can I make a side note, Chris, which is philosophical, but I do that because I'm an anarchist. Mm -hmm. I find it funny that we, you know, um, I'm, I'm not so much into the political process as I once was. So I kind of actually lean on you and Dennis and I appreciate you following that more because I, I've just given up on so much of it. But I do find it really funny when we talk about uh, people being involved in our political process in elections. That's what we do. <laughs> right. Well, that is the United States is really freaking good oh, at meddling at in people's it's elections. Good. And so oh. to be somehow be so offended that That's some other country who, who didn't even yeah. violently coerce us russia i mean whatever it's russia I'm not, I'm not saying it's good or bad one way or the other but i mean come on we like bomb the piss out of people literally allow their dictators to be murdered in the streets because we want somebody else in and we're gonna bitch about somebody offering something this uh, it's just well, if you it's look so at hypocritical the, yeah if you look at the ukrainian situation you look at what joe biden was doing and joe biden by all accounts has done absolutely nothing wrong because this is the way that the system works right joe biden well, he's a horrible human being number one and and he's i i can't stand the fact that he's on the board all right, say calm the children. Down. Okay. Calm but anyways, down. you're right. In that fact, my point, let, me, let me make the point. Joe Biden was basically using, he, because it, what Dennis will say is that Joe Biden was doing nothing wrong because he was with, acting within the foreign policy establishment and the World Bank and other people in leaning on the Ukrainians and withholding funds until they fired a prosecutor. Now, I'm not going to stick up for the prosecutor because he sounds like a piece of garbage, but like Joe Biden brags about how he went and swung his big vice presidential dick around in their elections to help you know certain people get elected and kick other people out it's like that's all we do like Mm -hmm. you're consistently trying to meddle in foreign affairs it's like yeah i i don't i don't get the uh the idea that somehow we are when we do it it's okay but when right we're a gas when somebody uh, else does it the the, the russians are propagandizing america it's like yeah yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah so so just to get into this conversation a little bit um two things first um we weren't actually holding aid it was the threat wasn't withholding aid it was holding um loan guarantees okay so we were providing we were providing a billion dollars in loans to help them with you know after their um, um revolution and everything and help get them going again and so it wasn't constitutionally mandated funds like in trump's situation where congress right. said you need to do that yeah. right yeah gotcha right. and it was like well, why are we giving you the loans if you've got a prosecutor who's not going after this the, he wasn't investigating the owner of burisma like he was supposed to that's what the uk was upset about but that's been sort yeah. of the point of like the john perkins book reinhold is that it's uh, the World Bank, oh, no. the United States. It's neocolonialism. We're, we're, you're dependent on these loans now, so do what we want you to do. 
Right. 100%. And then, and, and that's kind of how we operate, right? You know, it's just the way it's always been. The other thing I wanted to bring up too is, and I've said this before, um, Russia, we have a thing in the United States that we call um, freedom of speech, right? Not and, on the podcast. And, and freedom of speech is an inalienable <laughs> right. It means that since it's an inalienable right, that it doesn't come, the right doesn't come from government. So government can't take that right away from you, right? no matter who you are. Right. So why do, why do we say that Russia can't say what they want to say? I mean, it, they have an inalienable right to free speech to say whatever they want to say in our presidential well, election. So I would why adjust do you that. have law against that? No, it, nobody it even pays attention to that, Dennis. And it you're completely right. I wish right. people cared. I wish people actually believed in natural rights and that the government couldn't infringe on them, but they actually don't even look at it. Like, I don't think most people are even well-versed in what a natural right is. That's, and that's, so- yeah, they think the government owns them, and so you know. I, I genuinely look at Abby Martin, who was paid by the Venezuelan government, and I look at Daniel McAdams, the person who is Ron Paul's co-host, and I see some of the things that they say, and I really find them to be very suspect. But what power does Abby Martin and Daniel McAdams really have in this country? <laughs> if if let's say Daniel McAdams is getting a big fat check from Putin. And from all accounts, it's like, okay, let's find this guy. Let's hook him up with this prominent non-interventionist uh, congressman, Ron Paul, who has a, a new TV network. Let's, like, really compromise this guy and get him to feed our narrative. It goes out to a bunch of libertarians in black T-shirts, of which I am one. Like, what, uh, what power do they really have? You know Very I mean? little. Yes. Very little power, you know? And so, or Abby Martin, who goes on, uh, who's the progressive comedian show? I really like Jimmy Dore, or goes on Joe Rogan. Like, what, what power does Abby Martin, if she's a, a compromise from Russia or Venezuela, like, what power does Abby Martin really have? Like, there, who watches RT for fun? So the idea. I do. Oh, well, okay. Okay. You know, <laughs> I like, do. They're paying Adam <laughs> Kokesh. Who the hell, after 10 years in the libertarian movement, we all know who the guy is. And they're not, we're not listening to Adam Kokesh. So I do like RT, though. I have a couple good friends that, that write and are journalists for them. And yeah, but the, reach, the reality is the reach on those ads that those 16 Russians were charged by Mueller over and the. I can tell you as a person who does digital marketing for a living, who works with audiences for a living, you know, like David Stockman was on Tom Woods show saying that uh, evidence of Ukrainian meddling in the 2016 election was an article by the Ukrainian ambassador in the Wall Street Journal of Washington Post. One op-ed article in a newspaper is not right. meddling. It's no, not that's free speech. Yeah. It's not significant in any way. Yeah. Like, People, I think people don't have, and including congressmen, don't have an understanding of the absolute order of magnitude you must have in messaging for people to really buy into it. You really have to have a very deep, consistent, constant, like if you think about in the libertarian world, if I say boogaloo, many of the people in our audience know exactly what I mean with that word. Well, that's because it's been repetitively put into your feed time and time again in memes, in forms that you will accept. Now, could some Russian troll be creating the word boogaloo and trying to develop a network of libertarian Gen Z kids who are ready for the Civil War to light off at any moment? Maybe. But the reality is that's probably much more organic than the government would like to admit because if the government admits that messaging in a free society is almost completely organic and up to the people in what they decide, then they short circuit because they realize they don't actually have power anymore. And so the idea that the Russians are influencing the next election is just a narrative for them to continue the bludgeon against the duly elected president that they've continued. And so when you look at this OIG report, the most damaging thing about it is that it does confirm a lot of the concerns that many people you know tr trump took so much shit in 2016 in that election when he said they're hacking they're wiretapping my campaign and nobody at the time knew what he meant but if he had a copy of this 400 page oig report and that got released that day everybody would be like holy shit look what they're doing to this american citizen carter page 
you know, and, and so there, the reality is that the problem with the OIG report is that when advocates of, of privacy, like the people who have appeared on this program over the course of its history, the number one thing we said about Edward Snowden's revelations back when they came out on We Are Libertarians was, this is very dangerous. This is a secret information gathering uh, system for our government. Oh, let's look at Barack Obama, and we can say, Barack Obama seems very trustworthy. He seems like he'd do the right thing. What happens when the next president in, isn't that person? Now, that was years before Donald Trump ever thought about running for president. Donald Trump is not that person. He's a vindictive person. He is a person that has clearly tried to use his office to go after the people he finds to be uh, his tormentors. And so why should Donald Trump have access to secret FISA courts that can then spy wholesale on all of the electronic information of his political enemies? Why should he have that power? He doesn't have that power because he's being neutralized by the establishment figures around him and they won't let him do that. But what happens when the establishment figures themselves have a president like Barack Obama who is deeply committed to their agenda who then allow them to use these tools against American citizens whom they deem to be outsiders and a threat to their system. And that's what this OIG report does so effectively. And that is why it is not a vindication of this system. It is an indictment of the system in many ways. Uh, it really is. It is an indictment of these agencies. And what what's troubling everything you said people will care people I, people won't care they don't even understand the process and their rights they don't understand that spying on uh, since the patriot act i don't think most americans even understand what a violation that was because it's just normal now right um so spying on a president it doesn't that doesn't get anybody's like hair on anybody's neck stand up it's just a thing we do well uh, his, his defenders get their neck the hairs on the neck stand up, but only oh. because their president who's getting this treatment, uh, they're not concerned about the, you know, the millions of other people who are having to deal with this and they're having their rights taken away because of that. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing about this that really kind of gets me. And I think that's what a lot of people uh, like reason and some other, you know, all the civil libertarians in, are yelling about is that we've been telling you this is going on. This isn't an isolated inc incident involving donald trump and carter page this you, is you, and you don't have to like trump to realize that this is a problem right no it's 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 frustrating you're right dennis because it's like people are like oh but my team and this person did this and they shouldn't it's like D we've been saying this why did you not care when it was the person you liked or vice versa this it's just wrong across the board but we've been people are so conditioned i mean we're just we're boiling in the pot right now but uh, american well, society funny. doesn't care yeah, what I found funny, and it and it's, uh, goes back to the uh, impeachment and not the OIG report, but um, when the uh, phone records were released in the in the uh, report from the House, and there was just so much hand wringing over the fact that these phone records were made available, and it's it's like you're the people who you're complaining about this, your information getting released or your information being used and spied on. And you're the one who just a couple of weeks before renewed the Patriot Act. Right. <laughs> and just, it just you, you're supporting this happening to all these other people. But if it happens to you, you're going to be upset about it. That really irritated me. Yeah. So uh -huh. let's, let's jump back into the notes and let's talk about the seven problems that the IG office found with the very first wa warrant application. Now, they included leaving out the fact that Page in the past had provided the FBI with information about his contacts with Russian intelligence officers. <laughs> he told on himself, and they didn't count that. Uh, overstating the degree that Steele's prior reporting had been used in criminal proceedings. Omitting information from Steele himself that one of his sources was prone to boasting and may have some credibility issues incorrectly claiming that Steele wasn't the source of the leak of his information to Yahoo News, and even omitting some comments from consensual interviews with Page where he denied having met certain Russian officials. The errors were not corrected in the renewal applications. The IG report noted that the FBI was unable to corroborate any of the information about Page that was in the Steele report, and even as they kept seeking renewal of the wiretapping and Page has not been charged with any crimes. 
So Paige has not been charged with any crimes. They kept renewing, even though they knew there were problems with that particular surveillance. Now, altogether, the IG found 17 incidents, which, quote, serious performance failures by the supervisory and non-supervisory agents with responsibility over the FISA applications, uh, but they were still able to conclude that there was no political bias. The findings in this report undercut the government's position that FISA courts are, now they were not able to conclude that there is political bias. It doesn't mean that they were able to conclude that there was no political bias. That is an important point that seems to be left out of reporting by people like the Washington Post. They say it vindicates the, the FBI and that Donald Trump is making it all up, but that's not the case. Uh, they were able, not able to find out, that no, nobody fessed up for, to their motives, essentially. Now, the findings in this report undercut the government's position that FISA courts are a sufficient guardian of American civil liberties and that the FBI is capable of responsibility, responsibly exercising the vast powers granted to it. No one should feel confident that a court would block the FBI from engaging surveillance, even if the information was flawed. If this hadn't happened in such a high-profile case involving the current president, would you and I even know about this? A spokesperson for the FBI said the report does, quote, does not impugn the FBI's institutional integrity. It doesn't doubt or propose any changes to the FBI's mission or core values. It doesn't criticize or even question that the brand that this organization has earned over 111 years. Now, it just you may have heard the name Michael Horowitz. He was the Justice Department Inspector General. Uh, he announced in the report, um, sorry, I got distracted. Christianity Today called for the removal of Donald Trump. So uh, that's going to be screeching. Uh, so Michael Horowitz, I'm back. Sorry. General, that's okay. Also announced in the report plans to conduct an additional audit to determine how well the FBI follows proper procedures when requesting permission from the secretive FISA court to surveil American citizens. Quote, given the extensive comp compliance failures we identified in this review, we believe that additional OIG oversight work is required to assess the FBI's compliance with department and FBI FISA related policies that seek to protect the civil liberties of US persons. Accordingly, we today have initiated an OIG audit that will further examine the FBI's compliance with the Woods procedures and FISA and those uh, the Woods procedures and FISA applications that target U.S. persons in both counterintelligence and counterterrorism investigations. The Woods procedure describes the length process the FBI officials are supposed to go through when submitting a FISA application to make sure every factual piece of information had been properly vetted and verified. It is supposed to be a painstaking process of dotting every I and crossing every T to get permission to use the FISA court to sec secretly surveil an American citizen on American soil. Former FBI agent Asha Rangappa <laughs> explained in 2017 how difficult it was supposed to be to get a FISA warrant to wiretap Carter Page. The FBI should not have casually gotten permission to spy on Page for political purposes. Now, the ACLU issued a statement voicing their concerns about this report, saying, quote, for instance, the litany of problems with Carter Page surveillance applications demonstrates how the secrecy shrouding the government's one-sided FISA approval process breeds abuse. The system requires fundamental reforms, and Congress can start by providing defendants subjected for FISA surveillance the opportunity to review the government's secret submissions. The FBI must also adopt higher standards for investigations involving constitutionally protected sensitive activities, such as political campaigns. Um, now, in early 2018, the GOP and Democrats and the House Intelligence Committee released dueling memos on the FBI's FISA applications. The GOP memo, often called the Nunez memo, said that, quote, material and relevant information was omitted from the applications, including the dossier formed an essential part of the initial application, and there was minimal corroboration. The Democratic memo, memo argued that the GOP memo had omitted key details and twisted facts. I can't believe they didn't agree. Uh, the FBI and DOJ officials did not abuse the FISA process, omitting information or subverting this vital tool to spy on the Trump campaign, the Democratic memo said. Uh, 
Quote, DOJ met the rigor, transparency, and evidentiary basis needed to meet the FISA's probable cause requirement. The Democratic memo also said that the FBI made use of only narrow information from the Steele sources about Page's specific activities and that senior FBI and DOJ officials have repeatedly affirmed to the committee the reliability and credibility of Steele's reporting. So that's an instance where the House Democrats were basically sticking up for the FBI and got caught with their pants down once the OIG report came out. So um, clearly there are some very serious problems with the way that that information is handled. Uh, and it's very obvious, as any libertarian I think would agree, that a secret anonymous court that doesn't give due process to the people being tried basically is going to be abused by the government because the government is <laughs> the government is your judge, jury, executioner, and your defense attorney. Not surprised but, that there was abuse at all. That's just crazy talk, Chris. I mean, I know you're all in on conspiracy theories, aren't you? I know. Well, it's it's um, how government works. So the funniest thing I remember from the uh, the first days of the Patriot Act being um, used is a lot of people would get um, search warrants on there, and they would they would actually get notified that they're getting searched but they were told they're not allowed to tell anybody, including their own lawyer, that it was happening. Right. Uh, how do you mount a defense against that? If you can't, if you can't tell anybody, including your lawyer, what's going on, how do you even, you can't even say anything at all. It's just, it's, it's mind-bogglingly a violation. And, and what I want to see is I want to see when this renewal for the uh, Patriot Act comes up, I want all these Republicans who are complaining about this mm -hmm. to Donald Trump I want them standing up and saying, we need to not sign this. And I guarantee you that they all will. Except for five or six, I think. Well, mm -hmm. the, usual, the usual list. I would contend that the Patriot Act in my lifetime is the largest uh, aggression against liberty. Hands yeah. down. For myself as an American, obviously. I don't yeah. live in a foreign country where I'm getting the ship blown out of me. But it really is. I don't think people understand the gravity of it. Yeah, and, it, and as someone who's been around a little longer than you, um, the Patriot Act was really just built on some previous violations, you know, the RICO statutes and, and everything mm -hmm. else in the 70s and 80s. And in fact, the, uh, the phone records being released um, by the Congress, that came from an act from 1978. Mm. So it's, it's not something really new it's just ramping up it's like the patriot act is like uh the the slam dunk on the encroachments they've been trying to put on us for years and since nobody said anything back then everybody's like well it's just a little thing uh, and we kind of need this for this reason we need to go after organized crimes so we need to rico statues and mm -hmm. oh, we want to get the the drug dealers we need to get the drug guys so we'll add them to it and it just builds and builds and everybody little by little just accepts what's going on that something like the Patriot Act can happen. Uh, Cause if that had been suggested back in the seventies, everybody would have lost their minds, mm -hmm. but as they're conditioned to accept it over and over and over the years, it's, it's uh, like, ah, we, we need that. Yeah. Those, so you're telling the, me that it starts small and then the government expands it because the people don't give a shit that the government's expanding something. Yeah, it's, not it's, well, the old, it's the old frog in the boiling water. Mm -hmm. So you, if you try to put a frog in the boiling water, he's going to jump out, but you put him in water and slowly turn it up, he'll boil to death. So, and, and that's why um, it, it kind of goes back to my whole thing on the libertarianism is people want to have this big revolution that we're going to just change overnight everything about the government and uh, a libertarian is going to take hold. And it's like, that's not how it works. That's not how, we should be approaching it. That's how, you know, if you look at what the socialists did, they decided to do little by little by little. Yeah. Where libertarians decided to try and do it all in one big hit. They succeeded. Libertarianism didn't. So we, we haven't taken that lesson yet. In well, the it's, community. that's very true. Socialism is, you know, prerequisite or prerequisite to um, communism. I mean, it was designed that way, but it, they were smart enough to do that. You know, it, it uh, they didn't come and sell this. Hey, we're going to redistribute all the wealth and then eventually have one economy. And, uh, you know, they were a lot smarter than that. I, I think libertarians, we get so passionate about liberty that we're kind of retarded. 
Oh yeah. yeah. It, it, <laughs> And we're, we got a, I got a, I got us off on a little bit of a rant, but, uh, side <laughs> note, but, uh, yeah, that's the whole argument between radical, uh, radical change and incrementalism within the, the movement. It's like, there's a place for both, but you can't discount the effect that actual, uh, incrementalism has on affecting change because people, um, are not going to vote for something that they're too scared of. They they need to mm-hmm. be able to get up the day after an election and know that they still have a job, they still have roads to drive on, that sort of mm-hmm. thing. I mean, it's it's when they feel there's too much chaos being introduced, they're going to push back. But if you do a little bit here, a little bit there, and you prove your case, and you prove that okay, we don't think there should be as much licensing, you know. So let's take some of the licensing away. Mm-hmm. And you see that it succeeds. And now we, let's take some of those building permit issues that we have to deal with. And all of a sudden housing starts to increase and we, your housing uh, homeless problem starts to disappear because people now have places to go and provide people are providing places for them. Uh, you start to see this stuff affecting the community and you go, okay, well, let's try a little, I, we believe you now, let's try a little bit more of that. And, and mm-hmm. then you provide more and you, you get to that place where, people start believing it. You, they're not just going to accept it on your word to change society overnight. It's just not going to happen. No. And I, I had to come around to that and that's where, um, you know, being an anarchist, I, there's a lot of people and actually it's not a lot. It's just a small minority that have really loud, obnoxious voices yes. uh, that are all or nothing. And they'll, and they'll yell at me, but I didn't wake up an anarchist. And if it was up to them, I would still be a neocon. Uh, they would shout me down and tell me I was stupid and I wouldn't have listened. It was the people that, that were libertarians that, you know, said, Hey, what do you think about this? And I was a conservative and, and I didn't want big government. And so some of that stuff made sense. And then the farther I went, the more I realized how wrong I was, but it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and I don't think that uh, liberty is going to happen in one big fell swoop. That's not how that happens. But uh, yeah, yep. we, the Patriot Act was, there was the John the Baptist that came long before, and then the Patriot Act was the Messiah of the government. <laughs> well, I, get this, I get this message from people too. It's like, well, the, the United States started with the big revolution. I mean, why can't we do that? It's like that took years yeah. to get. Uh, you know, a lot of writers had to be writing, and, and the thoughts had to get put in. You know, and John Locke stuff had to get kind mm-hmm. of pushed around, and then. Uh, Payne had to write his his book. I mean, it just that took so much effort and time and and everything, and it wasn't as clean as people think it was either. You know, it's it was a bit of a mess. There's a lot of people who didn't really want or care about any of that. They just wanted to go about their lives, right? So, well, it was definitely you know. a culmination of philosophy and and a, and a good uh, fertile ground for it to happen. So it was a, it was an over it was not an overnight thing. Are we getting too philosophical, Chris, and not talking about FISA warrants? Yeah, yeah we're way oh. off the topic. No, I'm, I'm sleepy. Uh, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm very tired. Uh, so my brain wandered off, and I was like, I wonder if Harry – I hope Harry's okay. I haven't heard from him. I'm Hi, now. Harry. Uh, I always worry about Harry because Harry's so busy, and I don't want to lose him, but uh, he's, he's – uh, I'm overthinking. You ever do that where you're like, Harry probably just didn't, never saw the message? And I'm like, man. That's- Harry's going to see this episode, think that we tried to kick him off, tried to like, and I have this whole scenario that I'm sitting here worrying about. And I'm like, Harry is probably bathing Gunther playing war of wife. Who's three. Like his wife is making him Mac and cheese. Who knows what he does. He's drinking hot tea <laughs> right. by the well, Christmas you know, tree. <laughs> I, I didn't know that he's not playing paladins right now. I, I well, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you should have been more proactive with your communication, but you're also yeah, just like, get into discord and told him he reads the discord. I know. I know. But I'd also but everybody, everybody who listens to this podcast can join the discord and, and talk to Harry. I need talk people to go talk to Harry in the discord. Go, be there, but go to look at the, we knew we, we just go ask if he still likes him and then like check yes or no. And then if he does, you could send it back to Chris. That's actually a really funny troll. <laughs> go, on, go into the discord and just for like the next week or two until we come back ask harry like every day if he still likes me <laughs> <laughs> that'll be funny uh so that's how <laughs> please do that i will i will log into discord and laugh every time um all right so let's get into media bias let's talk about that 
uh, because it really this is one of those instances where the me the Trump is the Trump is just the lodestar for society right now where everything is about Trump everything that you believe everything that is reported everything is about Trump 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 and it's kind of exhausting because there's more than Donald Trump in the world but we just like I'm seeing like libertarians who I you know recruited ten years ago uh, into the LP. They're now like super pro Trump, anti impeachment. And it's just like, listen, I'm more skeptical about all this than like Reinhold is. But like, how are you going to jump from going? Like, he clearly violated his constitutional duties and withholding the funds that Congress said he had to disperse and he didn't. There's emails basically saying that he cut, they were trying to figure out a good cover up story. Like, how do you go from a libertarian less than 10 years ago talking about constitutional libertarianism to now you're trying to figure out a way to cover Trump's ass in, in violation of the constitution? Like it's, it's just weird how everybody's become obsessed with this guy and mainly the media, the media loves Donald Trump. Like they really do love that he exists because it gives them something to talk about. He's interesting. They hate nothing gives sometimes Nothing gives a person meaning like hating someone else or being petty towards them. And a lot of the actions of the media, like the, the, this uh, Washington, I, I believe it was a Washington Post mm -hmm. journalists. One posted uh, them sitting at a D.C. restaurant at, at a table. They've all got big smiles on their faces. And it says, Merry Impeachmas. And it's like. That is not the quiet solemnity of which we were all supposed to be operating in. Like the, the reality is that all of those Republicans who were celebrating the day after Trump got elected and were so excited and like the, their leftist friends were just like, how could they behave this way? How they, should, how they should show respect towards our grief. And now the table has been totally flipped. It's like, how could they celebrate on impeachment day? It's like it's, you just picked up the signs of the other side of the street. So the media has uh, just let's listen to some of what the media has said about this OIG report. Uh, Adventures in missing the point, to be sure. So Aaron Blake of the Washington Post wrote four takeaways from the Horowitz report on the Russia investigation. What was his number one takeaway? Quote, a triple rebuke to Trump's conspiracy theories. He wrote. There will be plenty of shouting in the hours and days ahead, especially given that Horowitz's report found some alleged FBI misconduct and omissions. But proponents of the Russia investigation didn't argue that it was flawless. President Trump and his allies, on the other hand, argued it was an unfounded witch hunt and lodged conspiracy theories about how it was an effort to take him down, even a coup. This Horowitz report in its core findings does not back up Trump's and his allies' conspiracy theories. In fact, it undercuts a number of them. CNN uh, led with, quote, conspiracy theories debunked and called the Russia probe, quote, legally unbiased before they conceded serious mistakes by the FBI that the network predominantly attributed to a, quote, low-level FBI lawyer. The article states, quote, the report accuses a former FBI lawyer of altering a document related to the surveillance of campaign aide Carter Page, but Horowitz did not find that undermined the overall validity of the surveillance. They also noted the Trump report, the report essentially rebuts more than two years of talking points by Trump and Republicans about a deep state effort to derail his campaign. The Washington Post also suggests that this report explicitly proves there was no attempt at a deep state coup. Trump made a statement saying, the report actually, and especially when you look into it, and the details of the report are far worse than anything I would have even imagined. This was an overthrow of government. This was an attempted overthrow, and a lot of people were in on it, and they got caught. They got caught red-handed. Commenting on this statement, the Washington Post wrote, Trump sticks with conspiracy theories. There is nothing in the report that supports an overthrow of government. In fact, as we noted, the IG found the political bias did not factor into the start of the probe. The IG report found that no political bias, that political bias did not factor into the start of the probe. Now, remember, 
earlier we told you that they could find no bias, meaning it's neutral. The Washington Post is telling you they found no, that it did not factor into the, into the probe. He, quote, even turned up text messages of FBI agents hoping Trump would beat Hillary Clinton. In many ways, the IG report would have been disappointing to Trump, yet he gamely suggests it's even worse than he expected. The reality is that that is a very rosy reading of the truth, whereas Donald Trump's is a very uh, positive spin for him, and We Are Libertarians is trying to bring you the information in the middle. Uh, clearly not a deep state coup. Uh, I have never bought into that. I totally get, uh, like, and I think a lot of libertarians are kind of seduced by, like, we hate the security agencies so much that libertarians are being seduced by Donald Trump's anti-security agency messaging. And so we're just kind of like, yes, daddy, do it harder. But it's not <laughs> like... It, you have to remember his higher goal is not to actually reform or end these services. It's to basically like give himself more power. So you have to keep that in mind, but the media completely missing the point and not talking about the important thing, instead talking about Donald Trump, the important thing being that the FBI is abusing their power as we have said that they probably would years ago when we talked about this. Yeah, and it, it it's funny listening to uh, both sides on that. Is it's like they could have come together in a meeting of the minds and say, "Look, this is a real issue that we need to address on how we're treating the citizens of the United States." But that's not what they care about. They care about the power that has been sucked up into the executive branch of this government, knowing that that's you know that's the important thing because so much of everybody's lives are now dictated by a lot of what's going on in Washington where it shouldn't be um, that they see that as the most important aspect of it. And you know, even Trump's trying to say that, I mean, th there were a lot of people, including Trump suggesting that they were going to be, Comey was going to be fired or arrested. And uh, I guess the morning of the report that Biden had been arrested, but what you were seeing of him on the trail was old file footage. He was actually being arrested and they're trying to calm it down. I mean, the crazy stuff that I've seen uh, is pretty amazing on both sides of the aisle, but um, the reality is that the real message is just once again, ignored and, and lost in all of this because everybody wants that power. If they get rid of the power, you know, they don't want to advocate that. They don't want to advocate for getting rid of the power because they just want to control it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, tr when Trump says he has a problem with the Fed and all the libertarians start going, oh, yeah, in the Fed, in the Fed, it's, he doesn't want to end the Fed. He wants he wants more power over the Fed, right, to <laughs> further abuse us. Um, right. It's, so, a, it's a half-assed attempt at reforming these things that are it, – it's like the people who argue for the Constitutional Convention – it's like, you, you idiots really want to open up the Constitution on a nationwide scale right now when the people are as socialistic and as greedy as they are now. The, the American heart is not where it was in 1791. Oh, yeah. And you want to open it. Yeah. You don't, oh, but you ironically, conservatives would yell about that because they'd be like, but the original spirit is like, you know what, bitch? We followed the Constitutional Convention. The original spirit means shit. Yeah, it's kind well, of funny. Well, the funniest part, too, is that it's like we should go for the convention, the convention. I'm like, if you can get um, everything you need to achieve a, con a convention, you could already take over and change the, the government as it is. Right. Anyway. Britain. You, you <laughs> it's it's like why go through try to gain that level of power when you could do everything you want with less than that, just influencing the current government. Right. I think that's just parties trying to find power. Uh, you know, it's left or right trying to find power and they're going to use the state to do so uh, because they can't understand spreading an idea of liberty. And Chris, you touched on something I do want to go back to about. You really do. Uh, yes. Uh, government, um, these, or, you know, the FBI, the CIA, the deep state, um, and all these conspiracy theories. And I would say there's some, there's something to them, but I, I get what you're saying in the fact that we give them far too much credit. And just like these, these reports kind of uh, lend weight to the fact that they're just really bad and they're not really out for a lot of political gain. It's not that they haven't worked um, you know, against certain executive, chief executive officers of the government before, but it's, it, 
they're not that put together. They just want to maintain their power. Like their, their world is not about taking Donald Trump down. They just really suck. <laughs> I, I don't think people understand that. They, they just want to power. They already have it. And honestly, they hold a lot more power than, than the executive of the government, in my opinion. So it just, it just goes to show you, not that they're out for Donald Trump, that they, just, they can do whatever the hell they want, and you mean nothing to them. Right. In, in the media focusing on Trump, too, that's not all the media's fault. That's a lot of it's uh, Trump. Because he will, unlike past presidents, he is a just a Gatling gun of BS information on a daily basis. He's tweeting 70 to 80 times a day now with everything going on. There's so kind much Kind of stuff fun, though, Dennis. It's kind of fun. But it's kind of fun, but you got to <laughs> understand, like, it used to be the news cycle would be like something would happen on a Monday or Tuesday. Everybody would talk about it for a week or two. And then maybe something else would happen a couple weeks later. Now it's like something happens on Monday, everybody gets outraged. And by Wednesday, there's three new things to be outraged about. And it's just like, you can't catch your breath. And the, the media is just sucking on that because they can take that level of, inf- of, of outrage and um, scandal and everything else that's going on from it. And they can build their opinion shows around it. I mean, you remember when CNN, CNN got big when, the Iraq war happened, right? And they were able to show 24 seven what's going on with the war. It was just a great thing. They got, they got huge boost in, in ratings because of it. So everybody started watching, but as soon as the war was over and there was a lot going on, it was just like dead space for so long that, um, then, and then the 2000 election happens and, uh, nine 11 happens and everybody's just plastered to the, the 24 seven news cycles. Um, and then the news starts to fade off again, and then they start losing money. And so they need some way to keep uh, people invested and watching 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And Trump gives them that. He mm-hmm. gives them so much ammunition to, to work with that they, you know, they have to be loving it. it um, he's it, a media star. He's a media the, star. I got to be honest, though. This is the worst series of impeachment out of the three. I thought this season of impeachment was just awful. Season three. You don't think it should get renewed for a, se- a fourth season? Is that I think we don't have a choice. Season four. There is first. no oral sex in the Oval Office. There's or no lying about it. I'm like, very disappointed in the lack of oral sex in this impeachment. Like, I'm going to be the, honest with you. Even in the impeachment prequel, the digital short that they aired, Ulysses S. Grant was writing his carriage too fast. Like that's somewhat. Stop it. it. Like, this is just some boring, like... That is the whitest thing you've ever said in your life, Chris. (laughs) Digital short. (laughs) All right, let's start (laughs) wrapping up. Let's start giving final thoughts. Uh, Dennis, show uh, Trisha how it's done in the final thoughts segment. Go ahead. Uh, Final thoughts on this. uh, the, The government is not good at doing things. I am. I think that's the the takeaway that nobody wants to uh, hear, other than libertarians, most likely. But it's the one that should be out there um, as the headline, right? So uh, I don't think anybody's going to learn from it. Unfortunately, uh, they're just going to try and take little pieces of what they can for their own little tribe, and then they can keep their power and move on. So uh, we'll probably need a bunch more of these types of things to happen for people to finally start waking up. Um, to what's really going on. So, um, but hopefully maybe this is the first step. Maybe this is the first part of that process that we start getting to that point where people go, yeah. And, and the one thing about having Trump as president is people, I've been waiting since day one for people to say, uh, look at how much power we gave the president, uh, the executive branch, and now look what's being done with it. We need to make sure that nobody else can get in and, and abuse it this way. And, I haven't seen anybody saying that even from the left. Right. It's like, that was my, my dream was we would finally get the left to say, we need to pull back the power of the president. We give him too much. The, the, the Democrats just don't care because they know that they're going to get back into office and they will still want that power. So they just, they just think that the right person has to be in power. So we're not learning the lessons we need to learn and nobody's holding anybody accountable and it's just frustrating. And Oh, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> that's, that's my uh, level of uh, disgust with what's going on. All right, Trisha, final thoughts, and then feel free to self-promote if you wish. Sweet. Um, yeah, so I kind of have the same thoughts that Dennis did a little bit about. Um, it, this is more so, and I guess this is a libertarian take. Uh, 
Hey, people, listen, DC's caucus and Reinhold coming together here on the yes. program. See how much I love. I love coming. Dennis. He's a Quit he's actually fighting. really. Dennis is really well read. I really respect his opinion. That comes from an honest place. So why would I fight with him? But I'm very pragmatic, which I will not. I will be called a fake anarchist tomorrow. But anyways, um, t talking about uh, you know, these agencies in the government, and a lot of people uh think, oh, they're out for this person or that person. No, they're just bad. And like Dennis was saying, don't worry about your team because your team could be in power today and you could use that government against somebody else. And then you could be the person out of power and they could use it against you. The problem being that they even have that power in the first place. So maybe don't use a giant collective force to control other people. Just spread the ideas of liberty. Um, fuck the feds, fuck the FBI, fuck the CIA and fuck the deep state. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yes. And so I did take a little thank you, Chris. Are you going to leave that out? No. This is a show for adults. No, we um, don't. We don't we, I, I may censor the C word. I feel bad about calling her the C word, but uh, okay. I, I typically don't. <laughs> That's on you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I did take a little bit of a break, had huge life changes, kind of went back to school, changed my job, career got engaged. Like I said, I moved. Um, but I am back into wanting to do my show again. And I have so many guests lined up that I had put off, got a new studio set up, which isn't completely in the background yet tonight. So I am so excited to bring you that stuff and bring you a little bit of anarchy on the We Are Libertarians podcast network. And so you can follow me, Trisha. I'm Trisha Arkey right now on Facebook. Trish uh, Trisha Arkey. Arkey. I did that just because of some job stuff, but as soon that will go back to my name. Um, Ginger Arkey, you can follow me on Facebook, Trisha.Stewart, Instagram, Trish Arkey. And then if you just want to go to We Are Libertarians, you can find me links there, also some other awesome shows. So get ready for more fun and more shenanigans. All right, very good. I want to thank uh, Sam Schultz for the great show notes, which you can find at wearelibertarians.com or in the, the description of this. I was remiss in thanking him at the very beginning, but we want to make sure that we get that in. Uh, thank you, everyone. We uh, appreciate you so much, and we appreciate you listening to We Are Libertarians. Uh, it is our traditional couple weeks off. I get two weeks off in Christmas time, and I just take the time off, and I don't. Uh, I won't be back until the uh, first week of January, the seventh. Uh, and I just try to recharge a little bit. I'm going to be working on some special projects, so I don't go get too bored. But uh, we will be off the next couple weeks. And uh, we hope that you won't miss us too much. Maybe you'll get caught up on some past episodes. Tons of great stuff in the in the archives for you to listen to. Uh, these shows are long enough that I'm sure you're like, eh, I should go back and re-listen to that World War One episode, uh, which is actually <laughs> my top three favorite. I was really I, actually it was good. I've listened to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you for listening. We hope that you have a great Christmas. We say Merry Christmas around here. We're saying it again, Trisha. Merry Christmas. That's right. Thank you, Donald yeah, Trump, for bringing back war. Christmas. Yeah, well, yeah, because Obama stole Christmas from me. Like, I didn't even know how to celebrate it until right. he was gone. So, uh, happy Hanukkah to our friends. Happy Kwanzaa. Should we have any Kwanzonians listening? <laughs> I don't know if that's a thing, but... Uh, it is thank, now. Thank you to our, uh, our Jewish friends, and I think I said Hanukkah. Uh, but thank it's you to cool everyone... Morning. Hope that you have a Hody. Yes. Happy Mormon Christmas to Hody. Happy. I don't know what the hell to think to my agnostic friends. Happy nothing to our Jewish uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, <laughs> if you're yeah. a, if you're a 16th century Puritan, you will please don't put anyone in jail for celebrating. Yes. So I think we've covered all the bases, to be honest. Um, but uh, Merry Christmas to you. I hope you have a happy new year. You know, m maybe we probably, now that I'm thinking about it, I I'm going to take the two weeks off, but we probably should like work on a show covering the past decade. I may go back through kind of the show titles and kind of look at what we talked about. Like, what are some of the significant things? This is the end of a decade, man. We're, we're going into 2020. So can you believe it? It, it's, I'm going to be 29 this year. It's crazy. That's amazing. That's the third <laughs> decade that you'll be 29. <laughs> Just kidding. Wow. All right. Wait, so, we, have to have the, we have to have the millennium argument again, don't we? Please so, download Ginger Arc mean, before I have to remove it from the website because yeah. you put the network. Reinhold <laughs> completely missed what I just did. <laughs> or he was trying to 
gracefully but move he, on. He was being graceful because he's married and he knows the yeah. wrath. Well, I'm divorced and I don't know any better. Oh, yes, you do. I won't say anything now. I'm being yeah. nice. I'm yeah. nicer than you are. Trisha is a beautiful, beautiful 29-year-old woman. And I don't care. Thank what you, Christopher. <laughs> Congratulations on your engagement. We Thank are you. very happy for you. We uh, know there are many boys out there mourning the loss of your singledom. Well, you can still listen to my show, and I'm really excited. Um, and I missed Wall, and I'm I'm happy to be back and Good. in a new space. So yes, and it's beautiful, and I love the uh, the flag in the back. What is that? Oh, uh, I have much more. This is the anarcho capitalist flag. Oh, I thought that that was like one of those holiday movie uh, fake kingdom flags. Right, it's that as well. I do have some books that will, and I have a large painting over here. And uh, please, like I said, that, please tell me that it's Ludwig von Mises in a bikini. Like it what? is not. Mises was such a minarchist. Um. Anyways, we'll get into that on Ginger Archie. I do. I actually, I enjoy Mises this. is now too, too. Uh, kind of a statist. For, oh, for fuck's sake! I can't keep up. <laughs> I don't care. I'm not even going to ask any more questions. Yeah. Like. Just tell me who I'm supposed to hate and who I'm supposed to like to be a real libertarian. Oh, that's easy. I'll make a list. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks for joining us. We will see you in 2020. And thank you, everyone. Is that Charlie Chaplin? Indeed. He's an anarchist. <laughs> Hi, Christopher. All right. If you get a chance, watch The Great Dictator. It's a great movie. All right. Thanks. Have a great time with your family. And we will have a great time with ours. And we will see you in the next decade. Okay. Yay.